Oh, hello. You know, sharks are pretty terrifying. If you've seen Jaws or Deep Blue Sea, you can definitely testify to this. But what's arguably more terrifying are squids. Okay, it's not actually a squid. It's more like an octopus, and it's not even an octopus. It's a head massager, so you know what? Fuck it. Anyway, how's everyone doing? I'm your host, Mark, aka The Movie Buffer. Back with another video. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. Our very first underwater creature feature. Come to think of it, yeah, this is actually the first one I've done. So yeah, I could say that with 100% honesty. So... Are you guys ready to dive deep and check out Peter Benchley's The Beast? Well, if you are, feel free to grab some snacks, grab a seat, and enjoy the show. In 1975, Steven Spielberg's adaptation of Peter Benchley's novel Jaws was made into a film that grossed several million dollars and was widely considered the first summer blockbuster ever to have existed. Peter Benchley also wrote several other novels centered around the ocean as well as ocean-themed creatures, one of which we'll be taking a look at today. That is, of course, Beast, which was released in 1991. I actually happen to have read this novel and enjoy it quite a bit. Although it did not get the theatrical treatment like Jaws did, Beast did see the light of day on the small screen in 1996 when it was adapted into a made-for-TV film titled Peter Benchley's The Beast. This two-part miniseries originally aired on NBC, although Sci-Fi Channel used to show it a lot back in the day, which is actually where I saw it for the first time. And I gotta say, while it's not winning any awards, this is definitely one of the better Peter Benchley adaptations out there and probably one of the better made-for-TV adaptations I've seen of a major novel. One thing I can say with 100% honesty that I really appreciate about this film, the book it's based on, and Peter Benchley himself, is that while his stories are still fictional and obviously certain details are going to be exaggerated for entertainment value, the size of the squid in this movie is kept at a semi-realistic size, much like the shark in Jaws. It just so happens to be a abnormally large animal. This is not an animal that was created by the results of nuclear testing or an experiment gone horribly wrong. This is an actual animal that is going to behave aggressively in order to both defend its territory as well as hunt, being that it is a predatory creature. The film opens up with a couple on their boat in the ocean. They're chilling, enjoying some sun, when later that night they get hit by a bad storm and their boat is eventually sunk. They are forced to escape on one of the lifeboats. Little do they know that a much greater threat waits for them in the waters below. <laughs> After they feel a massive thud from the bottom of their raft, the two search the waters to see what could have caused the disturbance. The man has his back turned when all of a sudden he hears a splash and a scream and turns around to find his girlfriend gone. We hear the sounds of something slimy climbing aboard as the man turns towards the camera and screams in fear. <laughs> So this is our main setting for this film, Graves Point, Washington, which is more or less a stand-in for Amity, the town that Jaws took place in. Here we get to meet our main character of the movie, Whip Darlin, played by William Peterson, whom some of you may remember from CSI. Whip, along with his 16 going on 26 year old daughter, are living their best lives as part of this quiet seaside community in which Whip works as a local fisherman along with his close friend and co-worker, Mike. 
Also, is it just me, or does Mike's actor look like Keith David? We also meet Lieutenant Marcus, the helicopter pilot for the Coast Guard, who in the film adaptation is a female and serves as more of a love interest for our main protagonist. However, in the novel, the character was a male and was more of a close friend than anything else. Come on, Whip, just give me the raft. Of course, I don't know what state it was in when you found it or what kind of damage it sustained in your efforts to retrieve it. Of course, you're probably slurring your words like that because you're drunk or maybe you just forgot your lines. <laughs> take it easy, take it easy. What's Graves gonna say? Better question is, what are we gonna say? <laughs> Fucking A, that shit eating grin. So Whip decides if he can't keep the raft for himself, he might as well sabotage the shit out of it. And Mike here is totally on board with the idea, as these two seem to be having a lot of fun tearing into this thing. During all this commotion, some type of heavy object falls out and lands on the deck. Whip later discovers it when he's by himself, revealing it to be some type of massive claw or hook. Now it's time to meet some more characters. This is Lucas, the village douchebag. His hobbies include illegal fishing, douchebaggery, drinking, and crab trapping. Great, and now he's tripping out thinking he's seeing sea monsters in the ocean. Damn it, Lucas, this is why we can't have nice things. And hey, I was just about to ask, where is our douchebag politician for this movie? So this is Mr. Graves, who's basically our Mayor Vaughn for this movie. Turns out Whip has been doing some research of his own, and believes that the claw he found may belong to a giant cephalopod of some sort. Of course, as expected, Graves brushes him off and he is forced to find help elsewhere. We then cut to a lab in Canada where Whip has sent off the hook to be examined. Here we meet Dr. Herbert Talley and his assistant. Wow. Archituthis ducks. They got themselves a giant squid. Well, I mean, technically it would be a colossal squid, being that that is the species that actually has hooks inside of its suction cups, as seen here. The giant squid does not have these features, although Archituthis ducks is the scientific name given to this particular species of squid. I know, I just have to ruin everything, don't I? The next day, Mike is walking on the beach with his wife when they come across the mutilated remains of an orca. There's also a subplot about his wife being pregnant, but honestly, it's kind of lame and forgettable, so I'm not really going to touch on that too much. And apparently, our buddy Lucas must really be hurting for money because he has to resort to using his boat as a charter for these two college kids to go scuba diving. Well, I'm sure this is going to end well for these two. No, Lucas, this is not one of your alcoholic hallucinations. That buoy did just go underwater by itself. Huh, and now the water is turning red and bubbling. Well, you don't see that every day. So Lucas gets a bunch of his redneck fishing buddies to throw some explosives into the water in order to blow the beast out.
This brings Mr. Tentacles up to the surface where the group can safely blow him to smithereens. And you know, as somebody who lives in Florida, these redneck characters hit a little too close to home for me. So happy ending. The beast is dead and the citizens of Graves Point can now live happily ever after. But wait, we have a part two coming up. And thus enters Big Mama Squid into the picture. This also marks the beginning of part two of this miniseries. After sightings of another giant squid are reported, Dr. Tally and Whip pay a visit to Mr. Graves and, of course, you can guess how this conversation goes. Yeah, he brushes them off, just like you would expect. He's also brought in his own professional helper, this hunter guy from Texas, who's basically our Captain Quint for this movie. So this next sequence is actually quite terrifying and claustrophobic, and I have to give props to the filmmakers for being able to set up such an awesome sequence on a limited budget. So Dr. Tally's assistant, along with a few other colleagues, decide to take a submarine and try to track down and kill the beast. Unfortunately, it gets the jump on them first. I'm on you! Get us out of here! I mean, it's honestly a pretty terrifying sequence in which these characters are trapped in this dark, claustrophobic environment several meters below the surface of the ocean while this creature pretty much plays hacky sack with their submarine. After hearing that Mike has joined up with Lucas due to his financial circumstances not being the greatest, Whip races out on his boat to find his friend before it is too late. Well, we saw what happened last time Lucas was put in a position of authority. Here's hope when the people working under him will have better luck this time. Whoops, just kidding. I spoke too soon. I gotta say though, I do really dig this close-up shot of the squid's beak opening as it bites into the boat. Now I could rip on the fact that the squid has a shriek that sounds like an eagle in this movie, but if arachnophobia can have a spider that shrieks like an eagle when it attacks people, I don't see why this movie can't do it too. So yeah, Lucas dies, and the cameraman tries to give me vertigo. So Whip is able to find Mike, who is thankfully still alive, in what is honestly a pretty heartwarming scene. We also get to see where they are currently keeping the carcass of the previously deceased juvenile squid, in which these two dumbasses think it would be fun to break into the facility and start playing with the dead animal. Fortunately, Big Mama Squid comes along and puts a stop to this real fast. <laughs> Oh, 
We also get a real good look at the CGI effects they used for the squid in this movie, which admittedly are not the greatest, but hey, still beats Asylum. And yes, I am so happy to see that the douchebag Graves is being forced to accompany our heroes out on this perilous adventure. I'm sure 99% of you who have also seen Jaws and Jaws 2 were hoping that the exact same thing would happen with the mayor in that movie. So, our characters set out on a quest to kill the beast, and it doesn't take them long to find it. They manage to tranquilize it after it attacks the boat. But this squid has a few tricks up his sleeve. Or, rather, her sleeve. So being the little bitch that he is, Mr. Graves decides, screw you guys, I'm going home, and says fuck the rest of my crew and takes the lifeboat in an attempt to escape. After realizing that the weight of the creature attached to their boat is causing it to sink, Whip attempts to sever the cable that is attached to it. But the beast awakens in a fit of rage. It kills the hunter guy, then takes a break from our characters to go after Mr. Graves, killing him also, not like anybody's gonna miss him, and then returns to attack the boat once again. No, not Dr. Tally. He had such a cool Canadian accent. Actually, he was honestly kind of lame, so yeah, fuck it, just eat him. <laughs> and this is where the film adaptation differs quite a bit from the source material. You see, in the original ending of the novel, Whip is cornered by the giant squid and is about to accept his fate when all of a sudden the ocean erupts from below revealing a sperm whale that has attacked the squid and winds up devouring it. Being that sperm whales are the natural predators of the giant squid this makes sense. However the film opted for a more explosive finale which is what we get here. <laughs> Alright, so this time we actually do get a happy ending. Our surviving characters make it back to shore, and Whip is reunited with his daughter. It goes without saying, I'm not going to critique this movie the same way that I would critique a big budget theatrical release. Given that this was a made-for-TV adaptation, I think what they were able to pull off was rather impressive. I mean, I already mentioned how I liked that the squid was kept at a realistic size. This is not a kraken or a mythical beast of any sort. This is a real live animal that happens to be exceptionally large and aggressive, but is kept relatively realistic in terms of both the size as well as its behavior and motivations. Overall, I will say that some of the effects, especially the CGI, have not aged so gracefully, but again, I have seen far, far worse. <coughs> I'm talking about you, Asylum and Sci-Fi Channel. Of course, some of the transitions and the fade to black where a commercial was obviously supposed to go can come off a little bit cheesy and may take some people out of the film. But it's one of those things you kind of just have to take it for what it is. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you thought about this movie if you happen to have seen it or if this video makes you want to see it or if it doesn't do any of that stuff. Anyway, I will post a link to my Patreon in the description below. There you will find early access content and exclusive content not available on YouTube. So definitely head on over there. I try to keep it reasonable. It's the best way to support this channel and allows me to put out more fun content for you guys over here as well. So check that out. And in the meantime, ciao for now.
I do have to give props to the acting in this film because while maybe the performances aren't exactly Oscar worthy, it is pretty evident that most of the actors in this film are taking their roles relatively seriously and are giving it their all. I especially want to give props to William Peterson as Whip Darling, as this man was mostly known for doing TV stuff, i.e. CSI, but manages to put on a very convincing performance here as a father who is just trying to make ends meet and is overall just concerned for the well-being of his family as well as his town and is frustrated when the politicians that run his town refuse to listen to him. Sure, it's a little bit tropey, and the film definitely does repeat a few beats from Jaws, especially in regards to the Great White Hunter and the corrupt politician. All that stuff has been done before, time and time again, but I'm able to overlook those little flaws in this film and be able to appreciate it for what it is, which is a pretty solid and entertaining miniseries. Where this movie really shines, in my opinion, are the underwater sequences. They're filmed very well, and the practical effects really do shine here. And while I'm not much of a fan of modern remakes, especially when it comes to films that were already done relatively well the first time around, I would not mind seeing a big-budget remake of The Beast on the big screen. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below about that.